All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome, for those of you who've been with me before, uh, welcome back to my studio here in Chelmer. Um, for those of you joining me for the first time, uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to do something I think that you'll find really interesting today. We're going to do a type of drawing we're going to look at uh, a history of drawing uh, and some really strange uh, sort of idiosyncratic modes of working in drawing. And then I'm going to teach you a method of drawing, which uh, not a lot of people use anymore, but is a very, very simple, very beautiful way of drawing, which can give you some effects that you uh, are not able to get in any other way. So we're going to go through. Um, we uh, talked about this, the Quiet Goma team and I, and we talked about having a little bit more time for these drawing sessions, because oftentimes in the past, uh, people were saying, oh, we wish we had more time. So we've extended our drawing uh, for an hour and a half here this morning. I'm gonna do a little bit of talking up front. We're gonna do a little bit of practicing. I'm gonna go over the materials with you. Uh, we'll go through all of that. And then I have um, one of my uh, favorite people in the world is here in studio with me uh, this morning. And uh, she's going to sit for a portrait. And so behind this curtain that you see here. And so a little bit later on, then we're gonna switch over to another camera where you're going to get a, a wonderful scene and we're going to be drawing from that scene for the uh, for the bulk of this morning's uh, session. So again, welcome to everybody. Let's go ahead and get started right away and talk about the materials that you're going to be using. Okay, I'm going to switch right now down to my drawing board. So there we go. And I know that that's a little blown out. I'm using natural light. So the uh, the uh, I'll have to ex adjust the exposure here up and down as the, the sun decides to move across the sky and the clouds decide to move in. All right, there we go. Now, um, what we're gonna start with today is the basic drawing materials that you need. What I have here first is the paper that I'm going to be using. And the paper that we're gonna be using this morning is just ordinary baking painter, uh, ba excuse me, baking paper from the grocery store. And there it is. <laughs> <laughs> from, uh, I think it was from, uh, I won't uh, endorse one of the supermarkets over another, but the baking paper is a really, really inexpensive, obviously, uh, translucent paper. And it is thus uh, roughly equivalent to tracing paper. Now, if you do have any trace paper, you're welcome to use trace paper instead. Um, of course, trace paper will be of a slightly higher quality than the baking paper, but if you don't have any trace paper available, just go to your kitchen, grab some baking paper, and you'll be fine. And for all of the demos and drawings that I do here this morning, I'll be working only on the baking paper. Now, I do want to show you just really quickly the difference between the baking paper and an artist grade trace paper. Now, this baking paper is uh, made of recycled uh, fiber, recycled paper, and also of wood pulp. And it's done obviously in a very inexpensive way so that it can, uh, it can be sold for you to uh, pop into your oven and do your baking. This piece that I have here is an artist grade uh, trace paper, which is made from 100% cotton. Um, so it's got the same sort of fiber in it that would be used in an artist grade watercolor paper in a, in a Western watercolor paper. And to show you the difference here, I'll use one of our images. So let me grab an image here. And this is, uh, this is Mrs. Yates, who we'll be looking at a bit uh, more here in a few minutes um, from the, uh, the Quagoma collection. But if I slide her underneath the baking paper there, you'll see how you get that modeling. Right, that uneven quality, because there's some places where the pulp is a little bit thicker, there's some places where it's a little bit thinner, and that's the quality that you get. Now, I'll take what is a good artist grade sheet of tracing paper, and I'll lay that down beside it. And you can see the difference, how clear and consistent that is. And so there is a very slight difference in the, the type of paper that you're using. However, I really love the quality of parchment paper or baking paper. And so that's what we're going to use here uh, this morning. Now. The way that these translucent papers are made is uh, they go through a chemical process when the paper is being created. And um, I, won't, I could nerd out on paper um, right now for y'all, but I won't do that. But essentially, they're exposed to, a, to an acidic agent or a caustic agent, which creates a gelatinous um, surface, which then uh, uh, gives that hard quality to the paper, but also um, gives you that translucency that you see there. All right, so you'll have your baking paper or trace paper all ready to go. It is very important that your paper is translucent for the method that we use today. If you try to work on an ordinary copier paper or white drawing paper that you can't see through, that won't work for the methods that we're going to use. However, I do recommend that you take a good uh, copier paper or white drawing paper and put it down underneath your baking paper or trace paper so that you're working on a white background. And that way you'll be able to see clearly what you're drawing here. 
All right, now to our drawing materials. We're gonna be working with a couple of different drawing materials here this morning. The first and most basic, of course, is just pencil, drawing pencil. So you see the drawing pencil right there. And uh, this is an HB pencil. So it's right in the middle of the hardness spectrum for pencils. And this is a student grade pencil. In fact, I stole this from my kid's uh, book list. All right, now, in addition to that, I've got some other pencils though that I wanna show you. So I also have here, this is a 2B pencil. 2B, so it's a little bit softer. And I'll just do uh, a quick, let me grab a little piece of, I'll move my baking paper and just do this on the white paper so you can see really quickly. Let me just slide that off to the side. And for those of you who sat in on some of my draw along sessions last year, we did a whole, um, I did a whole section on pencils and how to properly sharpen your pencil. So if we use here uh, an HB, you'll get a nice, uh, lovely light gray mark. If you use a 2B with the same weight, you're gonna get a little bit darker because the 2B pencil has more graphite, less clay in it. And then I also have with me an 8B and an 8B has a lot more graphite in it and thus is gonna be even softer and darker. So I've got a couple of different drawing pencils with me here uh, this morning. Now, if all that you have is an HB pencil or an old number two pencil, you'll be fine with that. But if you have a, a couple of different drawing pencils, pull them out and you can use them. In addition, you'll see me here using this morning a charcoal pencil and I'll use the charcoal pencil so that's a little bit easier for you to see on camera and it makes a slightly blacker mark and I also have for any of you who have a basic drawing kit a little bit of willow charcoal there and the difference between compressed and willow charcoal is that willow charcoal is pure carbon it doesn't have any other, anything else blended in with it and therefore it uh, it smears really easily the compressed charcoal will, uh, will stay, is a little bit more resilient there on your surface. So I do have a little bit of charcoal that I'm gonna be using. I also have a couple of erasers. Now, this is just an ordinary vinyl plastic eraser. Um, if you have this type of an eraser, or if you have this stick and click type of eraser, it's the same thing. They're just uh, plastic or vinyl erasers. And what I recommend doing with these for what we're gonna be doing today is just give yourself a nice sharp edge. What I do with my uh, erasers is I take my utility knife here, take your utility knife, and if your eraser starts to get really rounded off or dull, or even if your stick style eraser gets really rounded off and dull, just take your utility knife and just give it a slice or take your stick type and just give it a slice. So you get a nice sharp edge. In fact, I'll oftentimes take my erasers and cut them into wedges. So I've always got a nice sharp edge to use there. Um, and uh, for those of you who sat in on my life drawing draw alongs last year, um, <laughs> unfortunately I did a whole uh, little uh, 10 minute spiel about different types of erasers. Um, so you can go back and check that out. I also have a kneaded eraser or a kneadable natural rubber eraser here too. So if all you have is an ordinary vinyl eraser that's even on the back of a pencil, that's fine. Um, but if you have a, a kneaded eraser, you might wanna pull that that out. And then a few of the extra materials that I put on the list for this week, uh, pastel. So uh, a soft um, artist pastel, sometimes erroneously called chalk pastel. Um, I've got a couple of pastels here, so I can just show you how you can work um, with soft pastel. In fact, I even have a pastel pencil which is just a soft pastel encased in wood there, and, uh, but it's still the same material. And I'll do a little bit of a demo for how, for those of you who are interested in color or working with pastels, this is a very, I'll show you a very different way of using pastel here today. And finally, the last thing I have are markers. Um, uh, and here, this is an artist grade uh, marker, but I'm gonna also show you how you can use markers to give in this method to give color. So I've got a couple of, uh, of nice design markers there, but I also, again, raided my, uh, my kids' book bags and took a couple of their Crayola water-based markers. So I'll show you how you can do this with just a simple water-based texture. Uh, too. So those are all the materials we're going to use this morning. Um, I'm going to give you some, uh, some tips on how you can expand this, uh, the, the number of materials you're using. But again, if all that you have is some pencil and some baking paper this morning, you'll be fine and you'll be able to do um, some really amazing things uh, just with that. Okay, so those are all the materials. 
that we're going to use. I'm going to flip it up to me here for a second. There we go. Hey, y'all. All right. Now, those are the materials we're going to use. Before we get into doing the first demo and talking about the technique, though, I want to talk about the context for this. And so I'm going to show you a few works from the Quagoma collection, talk you through those works a little bit, and then we're going to come back to the drawing board and actually start doing some drawing. So while I'm talking through the techniques, it'll give you a chance to get yourself all set up, get your uh, trace paper or baking paper out, get your pencils, erasers, everything ready to go. Again, make sure you've got a nice piece of white paper behind them so that you can clearly see what you're drawing. And then when we come back here in just a couple of minutes, we'll be ready to start drawing. All right, I'm going to switch it now over. I'm going to share my screen with y'all. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a, just a few slides. All right, so there we go. And I'll pop this up to full screen to make it easy for everybody to see. All right, what you're seeing on screen here are, it looks like two paintings by Roland Wakelin, a very, very well-known uh, Australian modernist and, uh, well, uh, Australia from Australia, New Zealand. Um, but, and I, I wanna mention really quickly that last year, I believe it was last year, Angela Goddard, um, who's the director of the Griffith University Art Museum, um, did a wonderful lecture for Quagoma, which you can find online about, uh, about uh, Australian art. And she talks about all of these Australian modernists. Um, maybe Shannon could pop in the link to that into the chat. Now, what you'll see here, if you look at the, captions below these two works. You see on the left, you have the bridge under construction from 1928. On the right, you've got in the botanical gardens from 1928. One says recto and one says verso. Now, what that means is that these two works are on the same board. As you can see, this is oil on composition board. The artist did this painting on one side and this painting on the other side. So recto and verso is just a fancy way of saying the front and the back, right? Or you can think of it as the wrong side and the, and the right side or the front and the reverse. And so um, typically, why would artists do this? Well, oftentimes it's for economical reasons. So they wanna recycle their materials. They do a painting, maybe the painting was good, maybe it was bad, maybe it never sold, and then they do another painting on the back. And that um, you know, poses a problem sometimes for collectors and conservators to figure out which side do you frame, right? And which side becomes the front side. And usually it's the work that's deemed to be the more important work, which then becomes recto, the front of the work, and the other becomes the back. Although I find this to be quite a lovely uh, little painting there too. If we look at this next one by Roy de Mestre, another very, very well-known uh, Australian modernist uh, and cubist. Um, here on recto, right, the right side, you see studio interior from 1935. 10 years later, he came back and painted this cubist head on the back of this work, Verso. Well, what, you know, again, front and back becomes a value judgment, um, which can become quite complicated. And so even though uh, Roy de Mestre was really well known as a cubist, an Australian cubist, um, this work is considered a less um, important work, a less, it's not really even a finished work. Um, there's, I got some wonderful notes on it from the Quagoma team. And so this is considered the work and this exists on the back of it. So if you're ever looking through an art history book or an exhibition catalog and you see a a photograph of a work um, and then you see another small photograph next to it and it says verso what that means is that work is on the back of the work that you're looking at all right um, and a final example here by Eric Wilson, another um, Australian modernist, Australian cubist. And here you see that relationship that we just saw previously reversed. So on the back is this work, the violin from 1939. A few years later, Wilson came back and painted this stove theme from 1942, a cubist collage, um, oil and collage. And this is considered the superior work, the more important work. So now this is recto, then this is verso on the back. But if you ever see this painting in the uh, hanging in the in the galleries uh, at Quagoma, you know that this painting is lurking there on the other side. All right, now that's very different from a work like this by Helen Johnson, which is a two-sided work. And sometimes artists will work on both sides of a sheet of paper, a canvas, a board, with the intention that the work actually is two-sided, that it doesn't have a front or a back, but it is simply one complete work. And that's what we see here with Women's Work 1902, where you have an unstretched canvas, which has got work on both sides. So technically, it's not that front back relationship. Now, I'm going to get out of uh, screen sharing here for a minute, come back to myself. Another place that you will see that uh, verso recto relationship is in books. So if and I'll just grab my sketchbook up here uh, really quickly. 
and flip to some blank pages. All right, so when you look at a book, and this is very important when you look at artist books or even artist sketchbooks, the page that's on the right, that is recto, which is if you're ever reading a novel, you see how the, the page, the novel, page one will always start here on the right side. When you flip that over, now you're looking at the back. So the page on the left is referred to as verso, the page on the right is referred to as recto. And you'll see this again, if you're ever looking at artist sketchbooks, if you're looking at old illuminated manuscripts, anything like that, you'll see that kind of language. Now, why is that all relevant to us here this morning? The reason that that's relevant is because it goes to a type of drawing. And it's a wonderful method of drawing, was used extensively in the 20th century um, and is not used very often anymore, which I think is quite unfortunate because it's quite beautiful, which is a type of verso recto drawing. And when you do verso recto drawing, essentially what you're doing is drawing on both sides of a single sheet of paper. So you're developing the drawing on this side and you're developing the drawing on the reverse side. So the drawing on the reverse side is showing through the front side and giving you a set of effects that you cannot achieve if you're only working on the front side of the sheet of paper. All right, it's also a different way to think about drawing. Instead of thinking about the drawing surface as static and you're imposing marks on that surface, instead now you're thinking about the piece of paper as a dynamic surface and you can work back and forth from front to back. And let me, let's just draw together here for a minute and start to look at some of the potential for this. And I'm gonna do a little bit, I'm gonna use my charcoal pencil just so that it's easy for you all to see on the camera. But if you have your regular pencil, just grab your regular graphite pencil now and do this along with me. So what I'm gonna do is just draw a square, right? And I'm gonna keep it really loose and I can do you know, some, some line work like that on the front. Now, normally, if you were doing a drawing like this and you would put in some contour lines like you saw here, and then you wanted to add value to the inside, you would now begin to sketch in also on the front that value. Now the value and the line are intersecting with each other. And if you want to blend that value, or if you want to come in and erase back into that value, you're also contending with the lines. I'm going to show you a very, very simple way that you can do this completely differently. And that is just to flip the sheet of paper over. Because this is a translucent sheet of paper here, this baking paper, I'm now going to flip from recto to verso. So now I'm from the right side to, let's just call it the wrong side, but we won't be judgmental, all right? Because it is obviously a translucent sheet of paper, you can see right through to your lines. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna create a value, okay? And you can do this too, just go ahead and sketch right in, put that value in to your box. And you can see that I'm not even worried about overlapping those contour lines that I just created. And I can even come in and blend it, you know, with my finger. And again, I'm not even gonna worry about those contour lines because again, those contour lines are on the other side of the sheet of paper. Now, this is the reason this is oftentimes used in architectural illustration, editorial illustration, as well as by artists, is because of the way that you can get, you can clean this now and get a really clean relationship between value or color and line. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with my eraser and I've got a little piece of eraser that I've sliced here with my, uh, with my craft knife so it's nice and sharp. And I can now take that, that graphite or that charcoal right back off and I'm going to erase right up to the contour lines which I put on the other side. And you should find that your tracing paper or your uh, baking paper will erase really, really beautiful again, because it's got that hard surface on the paper. You should be able to lift that graphite or that charcoal right off and get a really sharp edge. If you've got a sharp eraser, you can get a sharp edge. And so I'm gonna go and I'm even gonna erase right on top of my contour. And again, now I don't have to worry about interrupting that line because the line's on the other side of the piece of paper. And I'll come along this side too, and I'm gonna erase that back and right up to that line. And this is a completely different way of thinking about drawing now. And then I can take that, and rather than trying to add that value on the other side and creating, um, you know, uh, smudging those lines or, or interrupting them with my eraser, now I get that beautiful clean line on this side. And now because I'm seeing through the sheet of paper, that translucent sheet of paper to the back, the paper fibers are, you know, are now in between 
me and the charcoal that's on the back, it flattens and evens that tone, as you can see, and also creates a bit of atmosphere. Beautiful. I got a little bit of charcoal there onto my backing piece of paper, but there it is. Now, imagine the potential of this. Let's say you wanted to create a gradient, flip it over again, and I want to do a gradient from light to dark, and I can just rub that back a little bit more at the bottom. And again, I can rub right across it without interrupting or destroying that line. I can even come in with my kneaded eraser and rub that back and create a gradient from bottom to top. And again, I can come back in and clean up those edges and I can just go crazy on it. And those lines are sharp and tight on the other side of the sheet of paper on the recto side. And then I flip it over and now I've got that beautiful gradient top to bottom with my lines. All right. So, um, you know, this the reason that this used to be something that was taught in art school and it was taught to artists and designers it was taught to architects. Um, and it was such a powerful technique of drawing largely disp displaced by digital drawing. So the way people now work in raster based um, painting programs like Photoshop and they build layers and they deal with opacity and transparency and they put their vector lines on one layer and their paint or color on another layer. This is a way that you can do that just working with paper and basic drawing materials. All right, so now I wanna show you, I'm just gonna turn my paper and show you for those of you who have any uh, color materials, the same thing will work with your color. And again, very, very different way of working, for example, with chalk um, or artist soft pastels. So I'm gonna give myself another little square here, give myself some nice loose line, there, beautiful charcoal line. And then I can come in and now what I've got here is I've got that soft pastel, but I'm not gonna work directly on top of this. Cause you can imagine if I were to work directly on top of this, now that lovely pinky sort of soft pastel is gonna blend with the charcoal and I'm gonna get that muddiness. And any of you who've, who've played with pastels a lot know how quickly you can lose control of pastel and it can get really muddy on you. But again, we solve that problem here by working with a translucent paper. So we flip that over to the back. Now I see those uh, beautiful lines again coming through. And now I can just go ahead and apply a tone. Oops, my sun just went away. The clouds rolled in, y'all. Okay, let's turn up that exposure and make sure you can see that. There we go. All right, if the clouds go away and it gets bleached out, I'll, uh, I'll turn it down again. All right, so I've let some, I've put some chalk pastel and just for the, the purposes of illustration here, I'll go just rub over it really quickly like that. And yet again, I can come back with my, um, with my plastic eraser and I can cut back through that pastel. And again, I can erase right up to my contour line without interrupting my contour line. I can er even erase right over the top of my contour line. And of course, because it's on the other side, the recto side, it stays perfectly solid and content there. So I'll just do that really quickly, but hopefully you're, you're doing this along at home. And there we go. So I've got that. I can even do, if I want to preserve that white space in there, I can erase a little bit more. And up there too at the top. And again, when I flip this over, because you're seeing now, again, through the, the sheet of paper, you get that lovely flat quality. So if you've ever seen old uh, drawings um, or old illustrations where they look like they've been airbrushed or something, right? They have that beautiful flat quality. Um, this is often a technique that was used. It was used on trace paper. It was used on a material called vellum, which is not calf skin. It used to be calf skin. Vellum is now just a generic term for a, for a, a translucent, a high quality translucent paper. It's sometimes done on films, frosted films, architectural films, or draft, drafting films. They're working on both sides of the piece of paper. And working verso recto gives you these beautiful effects which again, you cannot get if you're only working on the front side of the sheet of paper. Now you can do this as just one last demo before we get into our first drawing. You can also do this with the, with the water-based markers or textures I showed you earlier. So now I'm gonna go over to my soft pencil. So I've got my 8B pencil here and I'm gonna give myself one final square. 
again in graphite. And if, if anybody's ever worked with a lot of graphite and charcoal and line and value and struggled with constantly smudging and smearing as you're working back and forth with your line and your value, working verso recto will solve those problems for you. Now, again, if I were to go straight over this graphite with a, a light colored uh, marker, even one of, uh, like one of my kids markers, it's gonna pick up that graphite and it's gonna get muddy, right? It's gonna get muddy and, uh, and fouled by that. So yet again, I'm gonna flip my paper over to the back. And now I can come in using those lines I can see and I can create tone or color inside there working right up to the edge and i'm using a nice light stroke here so it doesn't get too heavy and again i could even create start to create a bit of a gradient if i want to get heavier on one side of the square and pull down if you want to get some different tonalities so you get that on one side and then yet again when you flip it over it's going to soften all of that because now you're looking through the paper fibers to the back and give you a nice even flat wash. And then with any of these, with the, with the charcoal, the chalk pastel or the texture, I'm now of course free to come back in and draw on the surface of that and erase back into the surface with my contour or value or whatever it is. And that, uh, and that value, tone, color, whatever it is, will remain nice and solid and consistent on the backside. So this is the basic skill that we're working with today. We're gonna to take it a lot further, obviously over the course of the next uh, hour that we have together, but this basic skill is playing back and forth, working on the front and back of the sheet of paper. And as we get deeper into the workshop today, you'll see that front and back start to become confused. And some of you will actually start to look at the back and say, oh, I think the back is the front. <laughs> and some of you will start to look at the other side and you'll start to see the drawing again as a much more dynamic, thing than just a surface with something imposed on top of it. All right, so let's get on to our first um, uh, more serious drawing and demo here for this morning. And I'm gonna go back to my regular, uh, my backing sheet of paper here. It's just a white sheet of paper and I'm gonna grab another sheet of baking paper out from underneath it. And uh, hopefully everybody has now seen the light when it comes to baking paper and not realized that you had this marvelous uh, material to draw on sitting in your kitchen drawer this whole time. All right. Okay, there we go. Whoops. All right, there we go. All right, now I've got my sheet of baking paper and now our friend from earlier, I'm gonna reintroduce to you. And uh, I know that Shannon put the, uh, the citation for this into the, um, into the text and the clouds have rolled in again. So I'm gonna turn up the exposure there a little bit so y'all can see that quite well. This is a painting, which is gonna introduce one of our themes for today. And the theme that, uh, that we're gonna talk about a little bit later on is the theme of what's called historiated portrait. Um, and I'll show you that term in a slide in, in just a little while, but essentially it is a very interesting type of portrait where rather than just doing the portrait sitter or the model, you do the portrait sitter in the guise of someone else. And so you can see why this would become really interesting in a contemporary context. So George Romney, one of the more prominent portrait painters in England at the end uh, of the uh, 18th century, um, did a lot of portraits of socialites and actors and things like that. And this was a very well-known actor, Mrs. Yates, but it's not just a portrait of Mrs. Yates, it's Mrs. Yates as the tragic muse, Melpomene. Um, and so it's, this really entangles portraiture in interesting ways because it is both a portrait of her, but it's a portrait of her playing the role of someone else. And then you start to think of the COVID lockdown and that, uh, that thing that went across social media of people dressing up like paintings and doing self-portraits, but it wasn't just a self-portrait. It was a self-portrait as a Vermeer painting or as a Romney painting or as the tragic muse Melpomene. Um, also, you have to think about this painting um, in the context of the uh, late 18th century and the fact that actors and acting was not such a noble profession back then. And so this also becomes a very important work because it was a work very much about how um, it was both Mrs. Yates as an actor, but it also as the tragic muse was about the seriousness of her profession. 
left there. So we are actually going to use Mrs. Yates in this historiative portrait as our subject matter using this beautiful work from the Quaigoma collection, which you might have seen in the, the recent exhibition um, at, uh, at uh, Quaigoma, where it's hung next to the Picasso, the little Dutch girl um, by Picasso. But it is a full size. As you can see, it's a full length portrait, um, uh, 238 centimeters tall. But we're going to look in at just her face, just her portrait here. Then we're going to get our baking paper ready. And then, oops, sorry, I lost my microphone. There, we're going to get our baking paper ready. And then we're going to do a little bit of practicing of verso recto here um, by looking and drawing her portrait, but working back and forth on your sheet of paper. All right, so I'm going to pull that down so everybody can quite clearly see that portrait on screen. And uh, you also have a link to it in the um, in the chat if you want to pull it up yourself uh, on the screen. You're welcome to do that, or you're welcome to just look at this uh, this hard copy that I've got set right there for you. you it's not important at this stage to see a lot of detail or anything like that. She's in her classical neo. It's a neoclassical painting. She's in her neoclassical garb. She's got this tremendous headdress on with laurel leaves and all of that. Okay. So what I want you to practice now is we're going to practice that method where we begin with contour drawing, line drawing on one side. We're then going to flip our paper over and we're going to start to add some value in on the reverse side. All right. So what I'd like you to do is grab either your charcoal pencil or your graphite pencil, whichever you prefer, um, and it's completely up to you. And I'm going to work in my charcoal pencil again, just so it's a little bit easier. I get a higher contrast and it's a little bit easier to see. Sometimes the silver of the graphite can pick up the light and make it a bit hard to see on camera. Um, so whether you're working in graphite or whether you're working in charcoal, let's begin with just a quick sketch take about two minutes here to, to sketch her out. And again, don't worry about too much detail at all. You can just work the overall shape and work right along with me at home. All right, so just laying out in line. All right. The general portrait here, she's got a quite severe nose and lovely, there we go. All right, and she's got this again, very elaborate uh, sort of you know, headdress on with uh, the leaves <laughs> and everything else going on there. All right, so let's do again, very, very quick, very loose. Don't overwork it, but let's just get some, uh, get some uh, graphite or charcoal down there on the page. And so you've got a good layout there to begin with, okay? So again, hopefully you're working. I'll give everybody just a minute there at, at uh, home to catch up, but just line to begin with, okay? And there it is. Okay, now, again, typically if you were drawing something like this, what you would do is come in now with your charcoal, with your willow charcoal, your charcoal, your graphite, whatever it is you're using, and you would begin shading, right? You'd begin adding value. But of course, as you add that value, you're also gonna be scrubbing your line. And if you came into a race, you're not gonna be able to erase the value without erasing the line, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we're gonna use this recto verso technique to isolate the line from the value. So we, I've got that line there now on one side, and hopefully all y'all do two. And now I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna flip it. So now I'm on the reverse side. Now, the challenge here is, of course, you have to see the value in reverse. So as you're looking at uh, dear Mrs. Yates over here, you have to think about that value also being flipped. So let's say I wanted to put in some of that beautiful sort of Baroque black background um, that she has there. So now I can come in and I'm actually going to do this um, in my uh, in my charcoal still. So I can come in and now I can start to add that value. And again, I don't have to worry so much about the line that I have there, I can just run right across it because I can clean up that value later. So I can add that value. Uh, you can do this in graphite or in charcoal. I can smudge and smear. Again, I'm not worried about it overlapping at all. I can come over here also onto the front side of her face and I can even get some nice directional strokes which cut right into um, the portrait there too. And I'm not going to worry at all about those overlapping her face on that side, because I can come right back in now with my plastic eraser and be careful your butcher paper for those of you who are working on butcher paper is going to be a bit fragile. It's very, very thin. So just make sure you're holding it tightly as you're working. 
I'll turn down that exposure a little bit so you can see quite clearly. There we go. And you can see again, because it's so easy to erase on trace or on butcher paper because of the surface, I can come and work right back in and keep my contour there and cut back into that value really, really easily. And the same thing with the front of her face. I can come back in now and using my contour as a guide, just like that, I can cut that right back okay now you'll see the effect take a minute here to start laying that value and i'm only doing the background value for now i'm not doing any value on the front of her uh, or in interior in her skin or in her face at all i'm only doing the background just so you can see the effect <laughs> blow off that dust a bit and now i'm going to take it flip it back over to the right side and you can see how you start to get that atmospheric effect. And again, because you're looking through the paper fibers to the back side, you can also see how it gives you atmospheric perspective. It settles that value down into the paper. So rather than that value feeling like it's smashing into her face or it's right against her face, that darkness starts to sink into the sheet of paper and move away from you. Really, really beautiful effect. And again, an effect that you cannot get in the same way, only working on the single side. So what this workshop is all about in see-through drawing, this seeing through to both sides of the, the sheet of paper, but beginning to also see that relationship. Now, some of you might actually flip your paper over and then you might decide, oh, wow, I really like the way that the back side looks, the value side, um, rather than the contour side or, or vice versa. And so again, one of the points of this is to start to see the drawing as a dynamic surface, um, which has, it's not a two-sided drawing, but it's a single drawing object, right? Which, uh, which has that, uh, that see-through quality. Okay, so now I've done a little bit of that. Now let's just go into her face a little bit now as well. Um, and the other thing that we can do, because the value is on the back side is now if I want to clean this up, clean up the contour or anything like that, of course, I can also work my eraser back into the line on this side. And that won't interrupt, of course, the value that's on the other side. And so I can continue if I want to, to develop up my contour, I can get a little bit more, you know, detail if I want to that's going on there. I can redraw in the shape of the face, you know, I can continue to work on the front side without it interrupting that, uh, that back side. And the sun has come out here uh, now quite a bit. So I'm going to turn that exposure down so you can see. So I can reestablish that contour there and continue to work it. And then if I need to, I can flip it over again and then re-erase back there. So it's just about starting to work back and forth, front and back in this dynamic push and pull of your line and your value. All right, so now I'm gonna flip it over one last time and then we'll pull this little demo to a, to a conclusion. So I'm gonna flip it over a final time here, back to the back side. let me clip her up there, okay? And now I can come back in because I just redrew that contour line out further and I can, again, re-erase on the back side to pull that value back out again. And if you start, really experimenting with this, you'll be amazed at the, the diversity and quality of different effects you can get. And then um, again, if we want to talk about color, what I could do also if I want to get, for example, her blushing cheek, as I could come in even introduce color yet again onto the backside, don't have to worry about it getting, you know, fouled by my charcoal um, lines that are my graphite lines that are on the other side. I can add that blush of color. I can come in with my kneaded eraser and I can really sculpt that too, okay? Or I could add other types of value um, to the back side of the, uh, of the page too. If I wanted to start to add um, some different types of value into her face, let's say on this side of her face, under her nose, into her lips, even if I wanted to pop a little bit of that red um, that's there. Uh, let's, in fact, you know what I'll do there is I'm even going to use my, uh, my texture. I've got this ruby red, uh, scarlet red texture. So if I wanted to even get a little bit of red into the lips, I can introduce bits of color like that on the back. And it will be very, very subtle when I flip it back over and you see it there on the front side. Because again, 
you're seeing through that piece of paper. And so you're going to get those very subtle effects. And again, now, because that pastel's on the back, I can draw, erase, you know, work back on this front side of it without having to worry about interrupting that. So that's the basic mode that we're going to operate in today. And again, what I'm hoping that everybody does there at home is just experiments, try some different things, try some different methods, pushing and pulling here. I'm going to turn up the camera so I can see y'all. All right. There we go. Try some different methods. Try uh, working that, uh, that line in and out. Try um, pushing and pulling that line. Try pushing and pulling that value. And then think about how you're working both sides of the sheet of paper and the dynamic interaction of those two sides. And I promise you, if you just give a little bit of time to this and a little bit of experimentation, you'll be amazed at the different types of effects, graphic effects you can get, and the way that can create a dynamic sense to your drawings, which you haven't actually seen before in your drawings. And I think you'll really enjoy it. All right, I'm going to turn this back down to my drawing board, and then we're going to get on to our final uh, drawing because uh, Alana is waiting for us, and, uh, and I want to show you one more thing. All right, so, and uh, you know me, I always talk too much and we run out of time. So let's, I'm going to share my screen again here. All right and open this back up. Okay, and there is the Helen Johnson that we were just looking at and those other examples of, uh, of Verso Recto. And now this is the last slide that I want to share with you. All right, now this is um, a wonderful work from the Quagoma collection. It is a self-portrait um, by a German artist named Kata Kolwitz. And uh, Kolwitz is one of the most influential printmakers and uh, drawers of the last uh, 100 years, 150 years, easily. Massively influential artist. And we have this very sensitive and beautiful um, example of her uh, prints in the Quai Goma collection, the self-portrait seated at a table. Now, over there on the right hand side, you see historiated portrait, which is uh, the, uh, the term that I introduced to you when we were looking at Mrs. Yates as uh, Esma Pomini, the tragic muse. But on the left, you also see the, the French term tableau vivant, all right, uh, the anglicized French term tableau vivant. A tableau vivant, literally a living picture. This is a mode of operating uh, in theater and in art now for a long, long time where people mimic or reenact um, famous images, famous paintings, famous pictures, famous statues. And again, when I mentioned the sort of lockdown, uh, COVID, um, uh, you know, sort of meme fest of uh, people dressing up as famous paintings and famous work of arts, reenacting works of art, reenacting them, that was a type of tableau vivant or plural tableaus vivants. And that is when you're doing this living picture with real models or real sitters who are getting into the poses, the living poses, this is a very popular theater entertainment going back to the 19th century on stage reenacting famous paintings um, and famous sculptures. It also became a very important part, uh, a very important type of, uh, of erotic entertainment during the Victorian and Edwardian era um, when nudity was very taboo, but you would do these, um, these tableau vivant of classical paintings and classical sculptures where you would have a, a, a model and actors posing. All right, now we are going to do a kind of tableau vivant here this morning in my studio. So I have set up behind the curtain that you've seen beside me, um, Kata Kolwitz's self-portrait seated at a table. And we have Alana um, all set up there. Um, we sewed uh, a dress out of paper uh, for her to wear. And um, hopefully none of y'all will zoom in and, uh, and look too closely at my sewing skills. Um, so, but we've got that. We've got uh, courtesy of a mutilated $5 table lamp from, uh, from Kmart, which is hanging there. We've set up our own tableau vivant. And so you are going to be doing this morning a tableau vivant, a historiated portrait of Alana as Kata Kolwitz, self-portrait seated at a table. All right, let me stop the share and come back to y'all for a second. Okay, so I think you'll really, really enjoy um, this exercise. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch over here in just a minute. Let me just pop up the camera so I can talk to you all for another second. There we go. So I'm going to switch over the camera for just a minute to our secondary camera. And that camera is pointed at our tableau vivant. I keep looking at myself in the mirror instead of looking at y'all. Um, so I'm going to point that camera over to the tableau vivant. We're going to get ourselves reset with our uh, baking paper or our trace paper. And then we're going to do a sustained drawing. Now, what I would ask you, you can, if you want to, do a single drawing for the next 40 minutes. Or you can do multiple versions of that drawing and play with it a little bit as we go. As we're going through that drawing, I'm going to be switching the camera back down to my drawing board. And I'm also going to be working on the drawing. and so. 
periodically I'll switch it back so I can show you all how my drawing is developing. And then you can get a sense of, uh, of how I'm experimenting and working as you're experimenting and working at home. And again, what we hope is that all of you will share these drawings with us. Okay, so over the next um, 40 minutes or so together, we're going to draw together. All right, so we're going to look at the Tableau Vivant. You are going to draw um, Alana sitting there and I am going to draw and then we're going to uh, share our drawings. Okay, so I'm going to flip it over now to that camera. So let me just get it set up and adjusted here. We're on. Alana's all set. And let me introduce you. All right. And I'm going to switch the camera here. There we go. All right. Good morning, Alana. All right. <laughs> Um, so we have, uh, as you can see, looking at the Colvitz, and it is self-portrait seated at a table. And maybe if anybody wants to look at the original, it's a very, very easy work to find. Maybe even the, the Quaigoma team can pop it up into the chat again. All right, so we're going to keep this camera on and faced here. Instead of an oil lamp, again, we have a, a contemporary LED. And so Alana is going to sit and pose for this portrait for y'all now for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Okay, we'll take, we'll give her a little break in the middle. So looking at this and reproducing um, the uh, the general kind of uh, vibe of the Colvitz, although uh, making it a bit ridiculous with our contemporary uh, circumstances here, but looking at the value too. So this is a good chance for you to really practice um, doing that value scheme that we talked about and really developing the contour. So um, I'm going to leave that camera on now and I'm going to come over. Um, I'm sitting back down at my drawing board, and now I'm going to go ahead and get myself all set up at my drawing board with my baking paper. So you at home, grab your baking paper. I'm going to move Mrs. Yates out of the way. I'm going to get a fresh sheet of baking paper, and let's take a few minutes here to do a first drawing. Now, again, if any of you who are out there want to do a sustained drawing for this entire uh, next section, you're welcome to, but I would recommend here at the beginning that you do a few experiments. Try a couple of different things. Try some sketching, try working verso recto. And then what we would also love to see is you sharing your two-sided drawing. So you can share um, with us images of the front and the back and, uh, and label them uh, as recto and verso. So we get a sense of how you're playing with it. Okay, so I have, um, I'm just gonna switch, apologies to those of you who are in the midst of drawing right now. I'm just gonna switch cameras for one moment. So I'm back here. I've got uh, my brand new sheet of baking paper there, all set up and ready to draw. I'm gonna begin by drawing, again, to make it easy for y'all to see. I'm gonna begin by drawing in charcoal pencil, and then I'm going to start adding value in the back. And I'm just gonna work black and white with charcoal line on the front side here and working with the charcoal value on the back. So that's how I'm going to begin. All right, let's switch it back over to, uh, to our uh, tableau vivant of Keita Kolvitz's self-portrait seated at a table starring Alana. All right, and we are all ready to go. So let's dive in y'all. And I'll just chatter a little bit at you as we draw. Okay, so I'm gonna pull out my charcoal pencil. Start with, again, start with um, experimenting, playing, really think about a little bit about how you're developing this drawing and then don't wait too long to flip. So as you're drawing, don't spend 10 minutes drawing on the right side, right, recto, before you ever flip it over. Start to think of this as a dynamic process where you are working back and forth, front to back and front to back and front to back over and over and over again. All right, so I'm going to start here and dive right in with my, with my contour line that I'm drawing. And then I'll flip the camera over in just a minute so that you all can see what I'm doing too. Okay, as you're doing your contour, um, we're really going to try to explore that beautiful deep blackness, but the Colvitz work is also an etching. It's etching with aqua tint and spit bite on it, and what that means is that uh, you've got some of those etching lines, um, which she's got in the plate. Now, we've created an ersatz version of that by actually drawing with ink right on the paper dress that uh, Alana is wearing there, um, but use those lines as a graphic anchor, um, but also use the blackness as a graphic anchor too. So let's get right into it. All right. And I'll flip over the camera in just a minute so you can see how, just how loose 
my contour is that I'm beginning with. Okay. I'm not going to worry about any detail at all at the beginning. And uh, this is a chance for you to play. Don't feel um, a strong sense of fidelity to the, uh, to the original Colvitz. You're welcome to just have a play with it. And what we've also done for this to, uh, to mimic the, the Colvitz is we've masked the camera, which is why you're seeing black on both sides of your screen. We've masked the camera so that you get roughly the same composition, too, that you see in the Colvitz uh, etching. OK, and I'm going to flip over the camera here in just a second so you can just see exactly how loose my initial contour is. So let me switch it back over to the drawing board here. Okay. And there is, you know, um, I did a lot of talking there, but uh, in about a minute, I've done just that very, very loose contour to start um, this drawing off. And so you can see it's not a lot of detail. I'm not really worried too much at this stage about capturing all of that beautiful uh, detail that you see in the work. I've just got that contour. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and flip my paper, even with that little bit of information that I've already got there. And I'm going to start to develop the value. Because what I want to do is I want to see the drawing again is a dynamic exchange between uh, verso and recto. I don't want to draw all on one side and then flip it and draw all on the other side and be done. What I want to do is work back and forth. Again, push and pull to use uh, Hans Hoffman's old uh, framing. Okay, so I'm coming in now and I've flipped over to the back and now I'm on the back side of the sheet of paper and I'm starting to lay in some value. So I'm just putting in some, some big areas of tone around her in this drawing. And again, I'm keeping it quite loose. I'm not worrying about polishing it too much. I want it to be nice and loose on the surface. So I have room to let the drawing develop. Now, I oftentimes talk about something with my students, which is responsive drawing. You let the drawing lead you rather than the other way around. Let the drawing tell you what's important in it, what's starting to develop, and then be sure that you're aware of that. You're, you're being uh, responsive to your drawing um, rather than just trying to uh, you know, beat it into submission or wrestle it into uh, a, a set of uh, effects that you want it to have. All right, so I'm laying that value out. And again, you can be quite loose with this. Don't worry about running right over your contours because you have that ability working verso recto to come, uh, to come back and erase back into your value. Okay. All right. So now I'll switch over to my camera again here in just a second. So you can see how I've started to lay out that value. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna switch away from Alana and switch back to my camera. Whoa, which is uh, blown out from the sun. Thank you, sun. There we go, so I bring it down. All right, so you can see I'm being quite loose now on the back with my value, laying that in so that I can now come back. Again, I'm gonna be quite quick and loose, but I'm gonna draw subtractively with my eraser. So just like I added that value in, I'm now gonna subtract that value, but I'm gonna do just as much drawing as I just did with my charcoal with my eraser to cut that back out. And you could just will be able to make that lamp, that, uh, that cheap Kmart lamp, you'll just be able to absolutely make it glow there if you put uh, some nice value in. So I'm gonna come back in and erase back on that side so that on the front side, I'm gonna to start to see that nice soft value develop all the way around. All right, let me switch it back here. And there we go, back to Alana. All right, and while you, while you draw, let's take uh, about another five minutes before we take a little bit of a breather. And while you do that, I'm just gonna build up a little bit more of the value around that lamp. Now, if you did one of my life drawing sessions uh, last year, 
you would have um, heard me say that a good technique can be to give yourself a boundary or a box on your sheet of paper. If you feel like you're a little bit lost on your big sheet of, uh, of uh, baking paper or trace paper, and that uh, it's starting to float away from you a little bit, you're drawing, just draw a few lines to give yourself a border or frame on your sheet of paper that you can work within. And I find that oftentimes helps people when they're uh, starting out drawing, or even if they've had quite a bit of experience drawing, it helps them just think through the composition and the dynamics in their drawing. And so I'm actually doing that right now. I'm giving myself a top border to this drawing, um, which is really gonna indicate where that lamp is coming down into the darkness. All right, so keep flipping back and forth, put in some value, then flip it, add some more contour, flip it, more value, keep working it up. So I'm flipping over to my contour side again now, and I'm gonna give myself a little bit more solidity to the contour. All right, and I will flip my drawing on in just a minute so that you can see it for this, um, what I'm still considering to be a bit of a warm up drawing and experiment before I go on to one final one. And I'll put in some of the details of her paper dress there too. All right, I hope that's all going well for you there at home, everybody. In the Colvitz self-portrait, we also put a brush roll and a palette and some other things on the table. In the in the uh, Colvitz uh, work, the original work that we are have used to construct our tableau vivant, um, she's got printmaking tools on the table in front of her. So it actually is an image of her as an artist at work, drawing and uh, and working on her plates. Oh, so I'm going to flip back over to my camera now, just so y'all can see how I'm developing and how that value looks from the backside. All right, there we go. And there it is. So you can see I put a little bit of a line across the top just to anchor my drawing. Again, that can be a really good technique to give yourself a line at the top or some edges, which can anchor you a little bit. Um, just if you're feeling like the drawing is starting to float on the sheet of paper or getting a little bit lost, you can do that. But you can also see how I've done that really quick charcoal in the background. And that charcoal is really settled in. Now, the wonderful thing about working verso recto is you can also add value back to the front of your sheet of paper. So now I could either go back into the back and even add more darkness in on the back. But if I really want to emphasize some, some um, intense darkness, I can even start to bring that intense darkness onto the front side too. So you don't have to purely isolate line on one side and value on the other side. You can start putting line on the back and value on the front. And again, start weaving that drawing through the paper and seeing right through the paper, rather than just thinking about separating them um, front and back. All right, how's it going out there, everybody? Is uh, Here, I'll switch it up to uh, my camera so I can say hello to you next, because I feel like I haven't seen you in too long. All right, um, there we go, hey. Um, I hope that's all going really well for you guys out there. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over. I'm sorry, I'm looking at myself in the mirror instead of looking at the camera again. Um, I'm gonna switch over to my uh, final sheet of baking paper for myself. We've got about 30 minutes left. We're gonna do one final drawing. Um, if you wanna continue on the drawing you were just doing, that's perfectly all right. If you wanna switch it over and do 10 more drawings, that's perfectly all right. If you wanna come along with me and do one more sustained drawing, again, uh, we set this drawing uh, workshop this draw along series up to be a little bit longer so that you had a little bit more time to do a sustained drawing along with me. Oops, sorry, I lost my microphone. Um, so if you want to do that, um, feel free to do that. But again, if you want to do a series of drawings, you're welcome to. All right, I'm going to put this down again to my drawing board, and then I'm going to switch it over one final time here to Alana. There we go. Alana, do you need a little break? How are you doing? 
You're fine. Okay, Alana's doing great. Okay, so let's, um, I'm going to switch over to one final sheet of baking paper now. It is um, 1130. So we've got about 30 minutes left together, y'all, just a little bit less than that. So I'm going to do one final sheet and I'm going to do one sustained drawing now that takes us through to the end. And again, I will leave the camera on Alana there. Um, so it's quite easy for you to see and draw from, but just, I won't do it quite as often, but every once in a while, I'm going to pop back over to my own drawing um, so that you can see my drawing and, uh, and see how mine is developing and the different sorts of techniques I'm using. And if I do something which I think, oh, well, that was kind of an interesting effect, I will be absolutely sure to share that with you. Okay. So so let's begin now. And uh, if you want to do, again, shorter drawings, feel free. If you want to do a sustained 30 minute drawing, I'm going to have a, a drink of my cup of coffee and I'm going to dive right in. All right. And those of you um, who have those extra materials that I mentioned, if you have um, a bit of, uh, of uh, texture marker, or if you have a bit of um, even uh, chalk pastel, soft pastel, or anything else. Even if you have crayons, wax-based media, colored pencils, uh, wax pencils can work really well for this too. Any sort of material like that you have that you want to play with, now is the time. Now, the one thing I'll say about working on trace paper, and y'all should be drawing, don't wait for me. Just get right into it. The one thing that I'll say about trace paper is obviously you can have a bit of an issue when it comes to wet media because it is trace paper, it doesn't necessarily work um, very well with wet media. So you have to be a little bit cautious if you're interested in working in watercolor or you're interested in working in gouache or any of those kinds of media, then you might have a, a bit of trouble um, because the paper just isn't uh, resilient enough for that. But any other uh, sort of dry media that you have will work really, really beautifully. All right. Get myself organized here. My microphone's a little tangled, and I'm going to get to drawing. Okay, now also, um, the final thing I'll say, sorry to keep interrupting y'all. The final thing I'll say is that uh, if you want to zoom in, like if you want to really focus in on the portrait of the Historia portrait of Alana Esqueta, um, you can, you don't feel obligated to put in the entire scene um, if you don't want. Now, just like last time, I'm gonna start with contour, but then I'm going to um, develop up that contour uh, in addition to developing up some line on the back. So I'm gonna start with contour on the front, but I'm also gonna add some contour line to the back too. And I'll show you that in just a minute. And I'm also doing a bit of a zoom in rather than doing the entire scene this time. I think I'm gonna zoom in and do a slightly larger portrait. I love that big paper collar pulling off too. So I'm gonna really emphasize that. Oh, and I'll show you another little trick of value, which I just thought of, which I'll show you here in just a minute when I pop back on. All right, I hope that's going smoothly for everybody out there so far. Okay, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna emphasize her hand too there on the table. And I'm gonna collapse in that composition a little bit too. Okay, so I'm going to come back to y'all now. I'm going to give you a little bit of warning. I'm going to interrupt you. So I'm going to come back to my, my camera. Okay, 
and I'm gonna turn my camera down a little bit. So I've started, I've done a little bit of a zoom in there um, that you can see. And uh, I've given her um, a little bit more so that you'll be able to see the effects that I'm doing. And one of the things that I'm gonna do next when I bring in my value is I'm gonna now bring in the background value here and I'm gonna bring in the background value there. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna push that background value right in to her, her face on both sides, but I'm gonna keep it fairly light. And then what I'm gonna do also on the back side is I'm gonna come in and re-emphasize some of the contour here and around her face, but I'm gonna do it on the back so that also pushes back and gets lighter. So that's the thing I'm gonna experiment with next and you'll see the effect. Okay, come back to Alana again. And so I've got that basic layout and I'm flipping my paper now to work the back. You may be able to hear me scratching away in the background as I lay in some big areas of value. And also for those of you who have charcoal, this is a nice chance to use willow charcoal too. All right. And you've got that strong value on the back side um, of her face too, on the left side. So you can let that bleed right in, which is what I'm doing too. And then again, as I said, I'm gonna come back and I'm actually gonna add a little bit of contour on the back side of the drawing. Now, the challenge when you do that, of course, is now you're seeing it in reverse. So when you're working on the back, obviously you've got to draw in reverse, which can be a little bit of a challenge but it can also give you some lovely unexpected uh, effects in your drawings. All right, so I've done that now. I've come back in and added some of that line on the back. And I'll come over and show you my drawing again here in just a second. And we're almost 10 minutes down, y'all. About 20 minutes left to go. All right, and I'm gonna come back over to my drawing now, just to show you really quickly. Okay, there we go. So I've added now um, both value to the back and I've added some line to the back as well. It's still very undercooked, the drawing, but uh, starting to develop. And now I'm gonna push and pull. I'm gonna start to erase and actually start to craft the line on the front side a little bit more. And then I'll flip it over and start to craft the line on the back side a little bit more too. So I'll check in with you again in my drawing in just a couple of minutes and back to a lot. There we go. All right, so up to this point, I haven't really used the eraser at all. I haven't been working subtractively. I've really only been adding, but now I'm gonna get in there with my eraser because our first 10 minutes is gone. So I'm gonna start to really carve it up with the eraser, both on the front and the back. And then I'm gonna show you another thing I haven't yet shown you when I check back in with you in just a couple of minutes. And you can also really look at the look at the mapping of the light on her face and around her eye, underneath her nose, around the lips, and you can really map that light out so you get that strong contrast from light to dark. Go. And I'm going to start to emphasize even some of the, the pattern there on her paper dress. Start to put in some of that line. Again, gives a nice graphic. And you can see in the original Colvitz work too, it gives a nice graphic indication of the sleeve, the shoulder, and that, uh, that really exaggerated collar that comes in.
Okay. And again, don't forget your eraser. If you're only working um, additively so far, don't be afraid to really get in there with your plastic eraser and start carving it up. You do um, sculpting lines. You might you hear it as line sculpting, line sensitivity, but you want to uh, give a sense of uh, some real shape to the line that you're creating. Okay, now we're a couple more minutes in. I'm going to uh, flip back over and I'm going to show you another thing that I'm going to use on my drawing, which if you have it handy, you can also use on your drawings too. So I'm going to flip back over now to my drawing really quickly. Okay. There we go. As my drawing is developing and another thing that you can do if you have it, I'm going to flip over to the um, Verso side. And now what you'll start to see now is some of you will start to have a, uh, a bit of a, a revelation as you flip it over, where you start to think, oh, wow, I like the back better than I like the front. <laughs> and so what becomes, again, the dominant side, you know, your recto versus your verso, that, uh, that is really uh, dependent on your own aesthetic and, and, uh, and what you think in the drawing. All right, so I'm back on the back side. Now, something I have not yet introduced to y'all is this, which is white um, soft pastel. Now, this is a white soft pastel that I make myself, and uh, I make it myself just so I can get so much titanium dioxide in there that it's, uh, it's just velvety and light. But if you have uh, an opaque white, um, that's something that you can also add to the back. And because this paper is translucent, you'll be able to see that opaque white coming through. So if you really wanted to hammer, let's say, a strong highlight you know, on the forehead. You won't be able to see it very well here on camera, but if you put that um, opaque white down on the back, when you flip it over to the front, it will shine through as a really, really hot white. So if you do have any opaque white pastels or opaque white material, that's something else that you can introduce. Now, the other thing that you can do, obviously, on the back is introduce color. So if you did want to, even though the, the Colvitz is in black and white, Alana is not. So if you wanted to introduce some color um, there, you could do that as well. All right, I'll flip it back to her now. There we go. And let's go keep going. And now I'm on the back side, and I'm going to develop my, uh, my value up even further. So I'm just going to keep laying in that value. I'm going to start to find the value shapes that are in her face. You can see those strong shadows. And the original has got those beautiful strong shadows too. And again, work with your uh, erasers by work subtractively and pulling back as much as you're pushing in. And I'm actually coming in now to pull a little bit more back out of her neck. And around her eye. I can't wait to see these y'all too. You've got to make sure that you share them with us. Um, and uh, and share them, you know, to the. Uh, I think uh, Shannon will come on the end and, and talk to you guys a little bit more about how to share these. But I can't wait to see what different kinds of things you come up with, um, and really how you just continue to experiment. Again, think about the drawing not as just a picture that exists on one side of the piece of paper, but think of it as this really dynamic surface you can work back and forth. And trace paper, um, we're using baking paper here, but if you go out and get a good artist quality trace paper, trace Trace paper is another beautiful sort of surface that very few artists use anymore, except to do preliminary works or transfer drawings or things like that. But trace paper, um, just like cartridge paper or any other type of drawing paper, is a beautiful material to, uh, to experiment with and use as a primary drawing paper. Don't only think of it as a tool or an instrument to get you to something else. It's a really beautiful thing to use on its own. All right. So I've done a lot more um, value and, uh, and drawing through on the back. I'm not going to, I won't flip over because I know some of you are right in the middle of what you're drawing. So I'm not going to flip it over yet um, to, show, uh, to show you mine. But I am going to come in 
on mine, I am going to put in a little bit of that white, that opaque white on the back, and then just to see if perhaps on camera if it picks up and you're able to see a little bit of the effect of that opaque white shining through. So I'm putting that on now. Trying to get that nice hot light there on the right side of her face. There we go. Again, I'm not sure if the camera will pick it up, but we'll give it a try and see. Okay, I'm going to give you about another minute, then I'll flip it back over and uh, and talk to you all about what uh, you can see in my drawing too. Keep pushing and pulling, not only working uh, recto verso, but uh, with um, with working both subtractively and additively. Okay, I'm going to flip it back to mine now, just so you can see. I'm going to try to adjust the exposure too. Just perhaps you'll be able to see the white coming through. And I don't know if you can quite perceive that, but what I've done is I've added on the back some white here, some white there, some white there, and some white up here as well. It's on the back side. And maybe you can perceive that at home. Again, I know that these webcams are not that sensitive, but putting that white on the back can really make it glow and shine through. And you can see as this drawing develops now, I've got, I've got almost all of my value on the back. I've added just a tiny bit of value on the front right here. But now what I'm going to do is start to develop up that value even more. I'm going to start to really pop in some darks. Um, and emphasize those darks and see if I can really make those, uh, those lights really shine and sing. All right, so keep going. I'm going to switch it back to Alana now. There we go. And um, believe it or not, y'all, we only have about 10 more minutes. So draw, draw, draw. Okay, and I see that Shannon has put into the, um, has put into the, um, uh, the chat there function how, uh, how you can share those with, uh, with Quagoma too. And given that there are so many of y'all out there, I hope that we get uh, a good big number of them. Okay, so I'm gonna come in now. And what I'm doing is I'm flipping my own page. I was just showing it to you recto and I'm flipping my own verso again. Oh, you know, another thing I should mention to you is you know, one of the things that my students oftentimes do when they wanna work with many layers of charcoal or chalk pastel and they wanna balance line and value, one of the things they do is they wind up playing with fixatives, you know, what are called workable fixatives or spray fixatives. And they think, oh, I'll lay down a, a tone or something and then I'll spray it with a, with a varnish and then I can work without disturbing it and spray it and work it and spray it. Um, and again, working verso recto is a much, much better way of working there than trying to to work in layers and constantly spraying your um, your uh, your drawings down with uh, with with varnish. Okay, so I'm on the back again, and hopefully now what I'm also curious about with y'all, um, I've got to sharpen my charcoal pencil here while you draw, is um, I'm curious about how you feel about each side of your drawing because typically when I do this um, exercise with students and they're first learning this technique. Um, it's about 50-50, about 50% of them decide, oh, the side that I thought was the front is definitely the front. And about 50% of them decide the side that was verso, that was the back, should actually be the front. Um, and oftentimes that happens because the reverse side can be more gestural and expressive. And the front side can be a little bit tighter and more linear. And then students will tend to drift towards the more gestural um, expressive side or the more linear side. All right, so I'm coming back over onto my back now. How are you doing, Alana? You all right? Okay, good, 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 good. And I'm gonna to start to add a little bit more deep darkness now to show through. Because right now I really have one quality of gray and I wanna get a little bit of a darker value there that I'm gonna add in. And again, I can do that. I can push and pull with my eraser without interrupting or destroying what's on that front side again. All right. And just keep flipping back and forth, looking to see how that, uh, how that value is developing and how that line is developing. And again, they don't have to be exclusive, work back and forth. And for any of you who are playing around a little bit with color, um, I would love to see that too. That would be great.
All right, I'm gonna do one more check-in with my drawing in about two minutes, y'all. And then everybody else, you've got a little over five minutes left, believe it or not. Again, these things go so fast. And it's good, you know, thank you everybody for joining me this morning. It was wonderful doing this uh, last year during the lockdown and meeting so many people who are locked down in Melbourne and other places around the country. And now that uh, things are, are moving in the right direction, hopefully we'll be able to do something in person soon too. And I can actually get a chance to meet some of y'all, which um, I would absolutely love. Okay, I am going to, as I warned you, I'll do another check in with my drawing really quickly, and then I'll cut you all loose for your last few minutes of doing your drawings. Okay, so ooh, that got a little bit darker in my studio, didn't it? All right, sun went away again. There we go. So there's another check in of my drawing. And now what I'm starting to do, as you can see, is adding some um, uh, some value, some hatching value, even on the front side. A lot of this line, I know it's hard to see on camera, but a lot of the line that you're seeing here is actually on the back of the sheet of paper. And a lot of the line that's happening around here and around here is on the back of the sheet of paper. What's happening in her hair is a mixture. Some of the lines on the front, some of the lines in the back, which starts to create just a sense of dynamism and texture and depth to the drawing, which is again, when you see it in person, and I know y'all are in person looking at your own drawings, you can really perceive that difference between what's on the back behind the paper fibers and what's on top. And it just, again, gives a kind of atmosphere and richness to your drawing that you can't achieve in any other way. All right, I'm gonna switch it back. I'll do a little bit more drawing on my own, but I'm gonna switch it back to Alana for your final few minutes here of working with her. All right, in the meantime, I'm gonna add a little bit more value onto the back of mine. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna have time to actually put in any color on mine. But again, if any of you have had the opportunity to really lay some uh, or experiment with some soft or hard color in yours, I'd really like to see that. And this is, again, as it is in all of my workshops, this is really tip of the iceberg stuff, y'all. So this has hopefully introduced you to a new way of drawing and a new way to th of thinking about your drawing and your drawing paper, um, hopefully to thinking about trace paper. Um, and even baking paper <laughs> in, a, uh, in a completely different way. And, uh, and hopefully you'll continue to experiment with it because again, there's so many different kinds of subtle techniques and nuances that you can get working verso recto um, that again, you just can't get if you're only look, working on the front side of your sheet of paper. So take this as the first step hopefully in a, in a long process of, uh, of experimentation. And uh, please continue to share that with me too. Um, as most of you know, I'm somebody who is, is very involved with and, and works in the, the realm of life drawing uh, quite a lot. This is a beautiful, beautiful method to use for life drawing, especially if you're just starting out with life drawing and you're trying to balance your contour and your value when dealing with the body and to get a really soft, natural value in the body. Um, if your life drawings tend to feel a little harsh and mechanical, or even, you know, they start to feel metallic in different ways, um, this working verso recto is a really, really beautiful way that you can, uh, that you can soften those up. All right, holy cow, it's 11.57. Okay, um, let's go uh, another minute here with Alana, and then I'm gonna come back to y'all to, uh, to talk to you a bit um, before I throw it back to the Quiet Goma team. All right, so another minute with Alana, and we'll give, uh, make sure we take a moment to give a special thank you to Alana too. All right, and again, keep experimenting, keep playing, trying different things. Nice thing about baking paper is that you don't have much of an investment there <laughs> in your materials. You can go through what's this, this box I have is 15 meters, you know, for, uh, um, I don't think it costs very much. All right, y'all bring it home. Last few marks.
All right. Please join me in thanking Alana. <laughs> How's your neck, Alana? <laughs> Excellent. You did a perfect uh, Kate Kolvitz. You had the, the spirit of it down. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to come back now to my camera. Thank you, Alana. All right. And uh, I'm going to tilt up here too. Here, I'm going to take my microphone off there. Uh, and take it uh, so it's not attached to my head anymore. There we go. I'll tilt myself up. All right. Um, thanks very much, y'all. Again, uh, it's so wonderful to do these. Um, and the fact that I can uh, be here in my studio and, uh, and to connect with y'all and invite y'all in, I just absolutely adore. And there's so many of these really wonderful drawing techniques. And, you know, I oftentimes lament, you know, the, who, the next generation, you know, who's going to be carrying these um, things forward. A lot of these drawing techniques techniques because of there are a lot of reasons because of the way um, pedagogy's teaching of drawing is done because of the digital circumstances we live in. A lot of these drawing techniques are um, being cloistered away or being lost. And so I really hope that some of these things that we're doing in the Draw Along series um, inspire y'all, get you to try these new things. They're all very, very simple. They don't require a big investment in terms of materials. It's just different ways of thinking about drawing, different ways of thinking about using your materials, of treating your paper and approaching your subject. Um, and so I really hope you enjoyed see-through drawing, verso recto drawing, and learning a bit about historiated portraiture and, uh, and the tableau vivant. And I really do look forward to seeing y'all again soon. All right. Thanks very much, y'all. Have a great day.